Good morning and welcome to the David and David on Real Estate Podcast. We are on episode number 96 and we're bringing back Elon Weintraub from the Mortgage Outlet because we have a lot more mortgage issues to discuss, to discuss and it's a very topical uh, topic in the industry right now. Um, and Elon, we're going to get into appraisals and mortgage qualifications because those two items are extremely important. We're seeing a lot of movement in the market right now. So thank you so much for joining us again, Elon. Pleasure. So let's get into it. Appraisals. What are you seeing in terms of appraisals? What guidance are you seeing in the market? And and what does the industry have to know? Yeah, so... Um... I mean, we could talk about appraisals for hours, but there's a couple of really big insights that I think realtors especially need to understand, and then obviously uh, home buyers. But what uh, what is an appraisal in a in a very simple way? Num uh, a simple uh, definition. A an appraisal is basically the lender wants to make sure that you paid a reasonable price for a property. So if you paid a million dollars and the neighbor sold for $600,000, the, the lender wants to know why you paid a million dollars versus $600,000. Now, if it's a scorching hot market and the neighbor sold for 600 and then the next neighbor sold for seven and the next neighbor sold for eight and the next neighbor sold for nine and you bid a million and rates are low and the market is scorching, the appraiser understands that. The appraiser's job is not to screw people over, right? If 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 you if I have clients and every time they come to me, the appraisal screws up the purchase, no one will ever come to me. Like my job is to help make sure everything goes. So a lot of realtors, especially, think the the appraiser is going to screw them over. All they want to make sure is that you paid a reasonable price for the property. Now, the second element that the appraiser looks at is is the house livable? If the house has mold and a bad foundation and a leaky roof and dangerous wiring, the house could appraise for the purchase price, but the bank is lending you money or the lender is lending you money based on your ability to live in the property or maybe to rent out the property. If it's if you're tearing down the house, that's a completely separate type of mortgage. So if a house, if you bid a million and the appraisal appraiser says it's a million, a lot of people think, oh, we're done, right? The appraisal's approved. But again, there's two elements, a million dollars, no problem. And then, oh, wait a minute, the house has mold in it and asbestos and knob and tube and UFI and, um, you know, all these other, there was a murder and there was a drug lab and there's like all these things, it's next to a gas station. So those are the two elements. Now, the other lens that I would overlay with an appraisal is, is it a private sale or are there two independent realtors involved? So let's say I'm refinancing my house and I, and I submit to the bank and I'm like, I'm refinancing my house. My house is worth $4 million. That's a completely um, like biased and singular view, right? So when I submit on my own, the bank might look at that a little bit more harshly. But if I have a listing agent and a buying agent and they're on MLS, and they're buying it together in an open market, the appraiser is going to look at that and say, okay, we got two realtors, you know, they're both professionals, the property value makes sense, and they're they're generally going to approve the purchase price. But if or if it's a private sale, like the mom is selling uh, this mom is selling it to the son, or you know, the cousin is selling it to the cousin, there's no realtors, whatever, they might look at it a little bit harsher. So those are some lenses, you know, MLS, realtors. Um, then the other thing is, you know, there are new construction where someone bought a condo five years ago for 500,000, it might appraise at six or $700,000 because obviously in those five years, the property has appreciated. So there's a lot of different lenses. Sometimes there are lenders that don't need an appraisal they have what's called an AVM. It's an automated appraisal. And it's like, yeah, the property value makes sense. We put it through our statistical model, no appraisal required. But if the MLS listing says things like, as is, handyman special, you know, seller does not warrant anything, 
the lender's going to look at that and that might automatically trigger an appraisal. But again, the key thing is the appraiser is not there to screw people over. They're more of a reality check. Like that's really what it is. But Elon, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but there's different types of appraisals as you've sort of alluded to. Like one is just on, on modeling. We've heard like there's these drive-by appraisals, just looking at comparables yep. versus actually going inside yep. and looking at that particular house. And I've experienced it on a, on a few occasions where we have clients buying properties, appraisal comes in, it doesn't meet expectations, they're short $50,000, $100,000, and you go, and the agent, and I've had good real estate agents involved in some of these where they've gone back to the appraisal and they say, like, what type of appraisal? Well, we're just looking at comparables, we did a drive by, and you know, you know, in the house next door sold for $100,000 less. You know, three months ago, and this one down the streets, you know, is, is around the same, blah, blah, blah. And the agent said, No, no, you got to come in the house. Like, did you know that they just redid all their electrical wiring in there? They got brand new plumbing in there. They just did a renovation in there. They got a new roof on there. They just spent $7,500,000 in improvements that that neighbor didn't. We got a finished basement. That other, the one you're comparing to doesn't have a finished basement. We did landscaping in the backyard. And, and gets the appraiser to come back and, and actually go in and see all these things. And all of a sudden they've, they've got a, an appraisal was redone. They got the value that they wanted. So how do you get like, you know, just because you get an appraisal doesn't mean like they're not all created equally. So how do you protect to make sure you're getting a proper appraisal? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm going to talk about my process, but I've had a like, I've had appraisals come in light and the, like, generally speaking, I don't tell the realtor or the lawyer because I want to solve this on myself. If I call, if David Gorski helps someone buy a house for a million and then the appraiser comes back at 900,000 and I call the borrower and I'm like, Hey, appraisals, 900,000. What do you want to do? Who do you think that borrower is going to call right away? David. And what's he going to do with David? David, you're an idiot. Why? Uh, and appraisal. And sorry, let's actually take a step back. What is an appraiser? An appraiser is some dude in Ajax, in Oshawa, in Collingwood, sitting at his computer. He doesn't understand, and it generally it is a he, but he doesn't understand and that this is the best school district in the city, or he doesn't understand that, you know, there are only three ravine lots in this community that are highly desirable and you managed to score one. It's some dude like at his computer. A good, you know what I tell people? A good realtor, if you want to know the value of a property, you don't go to an appraisal, appraiser. An appraiser is some random dude. You go to a realtor and you're like, hey, David, this is the address. And he's like, okay, that's on the south side of the street. The south side of the street is connected to this school zone. And by the way, I had a listing three blocks away. And that listing had 400 showings in the last one week. And it's unbelievable. A realtor doesn't do that. A realtor sitting at their computer for 10 minutes, pulling up comps. It makes sense. Send it off, off to the next one. Crazy. A realtor does way more than that. That's no, but that's what I'm saying, right? A good realtor. So if I ever needed to know the value of a property, like I would want a realtor because a good realtor, not someone that like is two weeks in and da da da, like a good seasoned realtor. Right. But going back to your question, I wouldn't tell the realtor or lawyer this because, or the borrower, because then they're going to call David Gorski and say, why didn't you pay a million dollars? And then he's going to call me. I'm going to call the, first of all, I'm going to pull up my own comparables. I'm going to look at the MLS. I'm going to look at the appraisal report. And I'm going to be like, well, wait a minute. You didn't adjust for finished basement. You didn't adjust for five bathrooms versus three in the comparable. The appraisal report does highlight all of these adjustments. This lot is 60 foot. The comparable has 40 foot. So I'm going to try to resolve it on my own. If I can't resolve it on my own, I might order a second appraisal. I, again, I don't want like realtors and borrowers have enough on their mind. I don't want them worrying about this. I will only engage if like literally I feel like I've exhausted every avenue and I, and I can't get it. But part of it, again, just to be very specific about your question, like was the drive by the right approach in the first place? Maybe if it was a major reno, they should have never ordered a drive-by. Maybe they should have ordered a full appraisal. 
So that's part of it as well. But again, when you get the report back, you can see the adjustments. Wait a minute, you adjusted $20,000. This condo is 300 square feet bigger. 300 square feet at a thousand square foot is a big difference, right? So we look at the adjustments. And, and anyway, there's a lot of stuff we can do to push back on the appraisers. Well, well, that's why I think it's really important. You know, like, like we got a, a pretty good triumvirate here. We, you know, we got a lawyer, we got a, a real estate agent, and we got a mortgage broker. And we always talk about this part, like how important the teamwork is, yeah. right? And this is a, a great example, because Elon, you as a mortgage broker, you know, your job, you, you got to get the appraisal done to meet expectations so we can get this transaction done. You need the appraisal to come in a certain way, yeah. you're, and you're shopping that around and looking for the right lender, et cetera. You know, there's it's got to be so much value that an agent can give to your process to help you through that process yes. by doing their job, by by their knowledge of the market and all those conditions and their knowledge of that particular property. What are the warts? What are all the benefits? You know, what do you know? What are the comparable that you know as a realtor? And, and you know, so you're working as a team. Get that information from David Gorski because he's done all his homework on that property. He knows the neighborhood. He knows the schools. He knows the parks knows the transportation, knows the particular house and the renovations that have happened there. He's got to feed that all to you and say, hey, Elon, here's the here's some stuff that you need to know that you get to your to and pass this information on to whoever's doing the appraisal. Yeah. Actually, funny story, this happened to one of my colleagues, but someone bought a cottage for like $1.6 million and they sent some random appraiser from like, I don't know, uh, Pickering to like a cottage two hours away and the appraisal came in $500,000 light. And it's like, this was like the best lake and the best spot on the lake and the best this and the best that. It's like, dude, what are you doing? Why would you even send an appraisal? Like, especially cottages, it's so specific, the lake and the water type and the septic and the heating system and the three season. Like, so that's my point is that Again, appraisers really should not be screwing up deals. They really shouldn't. Even in even in the height of the bidding wars, appraisers understood that the market is crazy hot and the last house sold for a million and you bid one two and that's the market. They're not they're not naive. They do understand that. But if the last house sold for 1 million and you bid 1.7 million, that might be a little bit of a stretch and Frankly, that's where a newer realtor or a less, ex, you know, less experienced or, or less knowledgeable realtor, you know, they're like, oh, my God, we've lost 10 houses in a row. Let's just bid 1.7 million. Like you can't bid 1.7 million. Like if the last house sold for a million and you want to go to one one and, you know, you kind of do all this stuff. But there has to be some realm of reality. That's all they're looking for. It's a check the box. They want to make sure you didn't go crazy and that the house is livable. That's all an appraisal is. Yeah. And that leads us back into, you know, the you know how important appraisals are as part of the mortgage qualification process. And yes. in the last podcast that we had, we started to touch on that and go through some of the criteria of, of, of what's really important in terms of qualifying someone to buy a yes. particular property. And I think it's worth for us to, to get into that a little bit more with you, Elon, with your expertise on that. Yeah, I mean, I have a couple of initial thoughts. So the first thing is, again, if you're a salaried employee, generally you could borrow three to four times your income. That's your starting point. So if you're, and again, it's very tough to buy in the GTA. If you're a teacher making 100,000, a nurse making 100,000, a police officer making 100,000, you can generally borrow three to $400,000. That's not going to get you a lot. That's my starting point. Do you have a co-signer? Everyone talks about the bank of mom and dad, but I talk about the co-signing of mom and dad. Because if mom and dad give you $30,000, that's not going to fundamentally help your mortgage. If mom and dad co-sign, that can really help your, um, your, uh, your mortgage. The other um, kind of commentary I have is that I use a very important word, but 20% down down is a magic number and that's a powerful rule 20 percent down is a magic number why is it a magic number because if you have 19.9 percent .9 down there's a whole bunch of other rules and laws and regulations that you need to meet 
And it makes it much, much harder to qualify with 19.9% down. As soon as you go to 20% down, like even as an example, with 20% down, we could go to a bank, but we could go to a credit union. Now, what's a credit union? A credit union, this is my kind of um, very uh, simple definition. A credit union is a bank that's a little bit friendlier than a bank, but they're provincially regulated. Okay, who cares? They're provincially regulated. Well, the stress test is a federal requirement. So credit unions, they're a bank, but a little bit nicer, a little bit, but they don't need to stress test your mortgage. So if you go to a bank, a bank might give you a $700,000 pre-approval, but a credit union might give you a $900,000 pre-approval. What does that mean? It means I could buy a, a house, um, in the right school district. It means I could buy a property with a basement apartment that I can rent for $2,000 a month that actually is better for me. It means that I could buy a house with a main floor powder room so that when my elderly parents come in, they don't need to go down to the basement and trip on the stairs. So these, when you talk about qualifications, these are the different options that are available, um, especially now given it's so hard to qualify for a mortgage. And Elon, what advice would you give to people? You know, I I hate credit card debts. I I don't like car loans. Um, You know, I I think as a society, we need to really work on our debt levels, right? So if you're thinking about buying a house and and, and let's say this is, you know, a two or a three or a four or five month um, uh, timeline on, on the horizon, what should people start doing today or what advice should realtors give their clients today to help them qualify in the next couple of months? Well, I have a very, I have a very simple answer. Can you hear me? Yep. Um, I have a very simple answer. Talk to your bank or talk to your mortgage broker on day one. Do not do anything. Do not take action. And I want to tell you, again, this is very important. I've had clients that have come to me and they're like, oh, I just paid off all my student loans. Oh, I just paid off my car. Oh, I just did this. Oh, I just did that. And that is the worst thing that they could do. I just closed all my credit cards. And the reason is, well, you just paid off your $50,000 student loan. Now you have less than 20% down. I would have rather you kept your student loan and then you have 20% down. Or, um, you know, I did this or I did that. I closed all my credit cards. Well, your credit score, one of the biggest factors with your credit score is your oldest credit card. So some people get a credit card in university, they never use it, and then they close it. But it's like, but that credit card had 20 years of of history, and you closed it. And if we would have talked beforehand, I would have said, don't touch your student loans, don't touch your credit cards, don't do this, don't do that. So again, it's very simple. Do not take action. If you're looking to buy in the next two, four, six, even 12 months and beyond, we could do a preliminary assessment. How's your down payment? How's your income? How's your this, that, whatever? How's your credit score? And at least build the foundation. And I've had people where maybe they even come to me in October and I'm like, you need to file your taxes. It's October now. File your taxes on the first day of February when you're in ABLE. Come to me on February 10th and then we're good to go. Right? So like start early and do not take action. Again, people do things that are obvious, closing my old credit cards, paying off student loans. Those can be some of the worst things that you can do. Do not take action. So how's that for a very specific example? That's, that's I love it. I think, I think that could go either way, right? Don't take action as opposed, uh, you know, don't pay down debt, you know, because you need an assessment. Completely agree with that. I think it's a simple but a very effective message, but it goes the other way as well, right? Where 
you know, don't make any large purchases. And it's so obvious. Yeah. Yeah. But how many yeah. how many times do you see? And, and, and you know, this goes up until closing, yes. right? Because yes. the mortgage commitment uh, can change and, and the bank can withdraw that commitment at any time. It's conditional. If you make a large purchase, like buy a car, buy a cottage, um, you know, other, other things out there, and it drastically changes your financial position, that could really, really hurt you. And it can really hurt you up until the day of closing. Yeah, and I'm going to use very colorful words as always. What I tell my clients is, you can go and lease three Porsches after the lawyer gives you the keys. I don't even say the day of closing. I say until you have the keys in your hand. You can get the keys and drive to the Porsche dealership and get three. I don't care. But you need the key, not even the day of closing. You need the keys in your hand because you're right. If you go out and and you get a mortgage commitment and everything is moving along and then the bank is just kind of finalizing the file and they're like, why does David Gorski have a credit inquiry from Porsche of Canada? It's on your credit report. Right. So wait until the lawyer gives you the keys. And again, I say this playfully, you can quit your job. Quit your job and get three Porsches after the lawyer gives you the keys. Yeah, yeah. Don't quit your job before the closing uh, yeah. as well. Just one point I wanted to pick up on, and then we're going to have to wrap up this podcast. Yep. You know, you mentioned the, you know, the bank of mom and dad and yep. how it's really important for a co-signer. But the other part of it, they might need that $30,000 from mom and dad to push them from the 19% over the 20%, yes. Yes. right? But yes. beyond that, I think, you know, you're right that it's, the value is more if they can co-sign because that will make them eligible for a much higher thing. But you certainly want to get pushed over that 20,000 threshold, which was a great point, Elan, and I hope people really pick up on that. So this this was fabulous, Elan. You're, you're, you're one of the best guests we ever get on. There's, you're no shortage of topics and and stories from from you, and it's always uh, great to have you on our podcast. We got to we got to uh, set up a time for the next one. Absolutely. Thanks, Elon. Thank Thanks, you, guys. This is fun. Awesome, guys. Don't be afraid of buying real estate. There are a lot of opportunities, and um, whether the bank rate goes up or down or stays the same. We're going to see hopefully more inventory levels coming and more opportunities being created in the market. Talk to Elon, get pre-approved, make sure you have the right professionals on your team and buy more real estate. Thank you, everybody.